I'm a feminist, but when Tom from Great British Bake Off turned up at my other show, Global Pillage, with some Smash the Patriarchy brownies that he'd made, I was a tiny bit disappointed when he added proudly, I made them with my wife, Kate. Here she is. <laughs> she was really nice. Though. She, was really, she was really, really nice. I'll tell you why I was a bit disappointed. Somebody had said, Tom from Great British Bake Off is here and he's made you smash the patriarchy brownies. I think he's in love with you. So what I'd been promised <laughs> was a man in love with me. And what I was delivered was some admittedly very delicious brownies, but with no romantic overtones. If I was his wife, Kate, I'd be really worried that he only loved me because my name was like cake. <laughs> that is woman's name closest said, to cake you can get. I take the cake. I mean cakes. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Oh, he like, hugs like... her in bed pretending she's an iced finger. <laughs> <laughs> It's not going to last. These were amazing. What he did, or they did, sorry, what they did, they had a great big piece of toffee and they put patriarchy on it and then they filmed themselves smashing it and then they used the shards to decorate the top of the brownies. They were literally decorated with smashed shards of the patriarchy. Isn't that cool? I was there. But I couldn't eat them because they were um, non-vegan brownies, but they said that I could eat the glass because <laughs> that bit was vegan. I said, I'm all right. Um, <laughs> so you didn't eat the vegan patriarchy that was a missed opportunity well you got look it's a smash the patriarchy brownie and I could just eat the patriarchy <laughs> patriarchy is not delicious it <clears> was <throat> <laughs> I am a feminist but you wouldn't know it if you saw me on the dance floor <laughs> yeah. I am very very disrespectful towards myself <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when Tom from Great British Bake Off <laughs> said, Kate actually smashed the patriarchy toffee because she's a woman and I'm not going to be all, oh, let me show you how to smash the patriarchy, honey. I was like, wow, what a great guy. But then she said he didn't trust me to work the camera. <laughs> and I laughed because I know I would totally press the wrong button at the wrong time and film my fingers. Can you imagine... If you'd gone to all the trouble of making the patriarchy and smashing it and then you hadn't got it on film, I just imagined this great scene in a sitcom where a man is shouting at a woman, you idiot, I smashed the patriarchy and you didn't get it. <laughs> no one will ever know. No, because now he's going to have to rebuild the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> to, in order. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't in order exist, to smash it. He's going to be sad about it. I am a feminist, but while I believe women should be able to do and be everything that they want to, I think they should do all of that while being blonde. <laughs> Why should they be blonde? Do you know what? It's one of those... I know, I know it's not good that I think that. And I know it's not right and it's not fair and it's something I've had since I was a very little girl. Just that everyone should be blonde. Everyone should... I really That's so like racist for a start. Hair. I know. That's I'm horrifyingly saying. racist. Oh, OK. Let's not all have a go at Sarah. Um, I think I'm, it's all I'm, right I'm to have a go. That's no. a bit like punching a Nazi, though, isn't it? You can't no. say no. everyone no. should be blonde. No, I'm not saying I'm going to enforce it. Oh, I'm not saying. Oh, I'm like, well, even secretly... That's so incredibly grateful secretly. for your lack of... <laughs> hey, I feel sorry for you guys. Don't you think... <laughs> That would be my march. Would <laughs> it just spraying peroxide on <laughs> unwilling people? Um, sometimes, no, this is the thing. You know, like you have like, voices in your head, you think that is an idiot. One of my idiot voices is just like, but why don't they when it's so easy to dye it? <laughs> because, well, actually, I am going to go blonde for a guilty feminist episode. Congratulations. As... <laughs> just to see if the world is different. But. I think yeah. you should go the brunette. Is, the world isn't different. I can't. I had a bad dream about it. Oh. No, and also, my hair is naturally brown. My hair's naturally brown. I think that's oh, why okay, I have okay. it. I've got All right. real brunette's shame. I'm a feminist, but when I wrote these, I didn't know that Tom from Bake Off and his wife Kate were going to be in the audience tonight. <gasps> no! <laughs> they're not. Well, hold on. We'll see if they're still here. Oh, my God. Tom, are you here? There they are. There they are. Yeah, Tom and Kate made us. Uh, I think pardon. you owe somebody an apology. <laughs> Why? Because you said their marriage isn't going to last while they were in the room. No, I did. I wasn't talking about them. I was talking about me when you said I was a Nazi. <laughs> oh, 
no. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, of course. We're, so mm. this is it's a, it's a good reminder, isn't it? About <laughs> watching our mouths. <laughs> so really, good not, get, not getting carried away with ourselves. Yeah. I am a feminist, but I'm one of the ones who doesn't really understand it and just uses it as an excuse to hate men. <laughs> I'm the one giving the rest of you a bad name. <laughs> that is so not true. Not the blonde thing. It's just a bit of comedy. <laughs> come on, come on. All right. So uh... live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents the Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White and guest co-host Sarah Pascoe talking about activism. <laughs> This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. So tonight's episode is about activism. Give us a cheer if you were on the march on the weekend. Give us a cheer if you weren't on the march. See, that was a sadder cheer. That was a less empowered cheer, that was. But give me a cheer if you're going to go on the next march. Excellent. See, that was everybody then. That I was everybody. I, I might not go. You didn't even say what it was about. It could be a trick. <laughs> just it's agreeing true. to march for something before you yeah. even know. Yeah, it's true, actually. I didn't tell you it was a march for uh, more beautiful clothes for me, yeah. I think. so. <laughs> they. order. Yeah, absolutely. See, this is why you've got to check. That's the first yeah. lesson of the guilty yeah. feminist. It's a march straight to Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I planned the show months ago and had no idea how incredibly zeitgeist I was going to be. When you booked for the show, just go, woo, if you knew it was about activism? Nobody. Right, so... Because they march first, and they yeah. ask questions later. That's clearly <laughs> what has happened. You're feeling quite active at the moment. You're feeling quite activised. That's not really a word, is it? What, what, feeling quite... Active? Activated. 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 They do with almonds that makes them cost two pounds more. I don't know what it is. They activate the almonds? Yeah, it, you take less time to digest them. They're partially digested, but it's not gross, apparently. Partially <laughs> digested almonds? That yeah. sounds like something they a vegan would eat, Sarah Pasco. Yeah, we do, because it's more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> we do want cheap almonds. <laughs> That's our entire lunch. <laughs> Just almonds and string. <laughs> string? Yeah. I don't know, that's what I imagine vegans eat, almonds and string. It reminds yeah. us too much of the entrails of the animals we love. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> just, just, cry just, string. just almonds hold the string. Activism. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about activism. Yes. Uh, so how do you generally feel about activism? Um, I've never done any. I'm very suspicious of it. Oh. I say, yeah. Most people I've met who say they are activists, Ooh, not fun. Uh, <laughs> not, not fun to be around. Online activism I particularly despise. Yep. Um, I'm very wary of things that are about that we do to kind of say that we're good people and oh I'm one of the mm -mm, and uh, or showing off to other people and, and so I'm very wary of activism actually. Okay. Well, tonight prepare to be seduced yeah. by activism. Thank you. So that by the time you leave here, you know, I can't say I'm a professional activist by any means. No. But we do know people who do describe themselves as like oh comedian activist. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very I, that's what I think. It's a very arrogant thing to say. Okay, well, we haven't brought our guests on yet, so... I know, and I'm prepared. <laughs> yeah, but you do know they're listening in the wings, yeah. though, so... The arrogant bastards. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Questions. Hmm? Can I ask questions? Oh. Isn't being a vegan a, a bit of the same that being an activist? Because you're taking a stand for something? Well, that's oh, the thing. Oh, it's kicked off already. <laughs> that's the thing about how you define the term activism, because I don't think of veganism as a form of activism because it's so personal it's something that I'm very willing to talk to people about but I feel so much of something I do for myself because I believe something's right there's an activism part of veganism which involves talking about it and trying to convert other people and getting information across which actually is something I feel very shy of because I think I've found people respond to it so badly so I guess it's, it's just me so it's not me saying that activism shouldn't exist it's that I feel very very unqualified that I'm right about anything W won't the animals, though, be sad <laughs> that, that you yeah, understand really, yeah. that we shouldn't be eating mm. them or using their products yeah. and you can't be bothered to tell anyone in case they don't like you? Um, <laughs> no, so we have to unpack what you just said. Number one, animals feeling sad, that's anthropomorphism. You're giving a human emotion to a creature. And also the idea that people shouldn't eat animals. Isn't, you can be a vegan and still think that we evolved to eat animals. We, in our diet, need protein, a huge amount of it. 
thinking that animals should be respected and not farmed in cruel ways is entirely different. Well, that's sort of my sort of veganism. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want animals to be treated nicely, yeah. but sometimes when it's delicious or, <laughs> or, or socially yeah. awkward not to, yeah. I do, I sort of, yeah. I've decided I want to do 80% of the right things yeah. 80% of the time because that's yes. still better oh, absolutely. So this is than the thing, doing nothing. So this is the thing about me with my veganism and the way that I decide to talk about it, especially because of commentary, I have a mouthpiece and I want to be very responsible, is I found that if you make people feel bad about something, they do more of it. I feel like we shouldn't be telling ourselves we're bad all the time. Like, oh, I slipped up, I had that sandwich. Rather than, I was starving and I enjoyed it and I had to nurture myself firstly so I could go out and do other good things. This is why the vegans hate me as well, by the way, because (laughs) I don't have a hard line on it and I should have. Right, okay. Well, no, there's no should. There's no should here at The Guilty Feminist. That's why it's called The Guilty yeah, Feminist. Yeah. I'm going to start my own Not the shoot. definite, the earnest vegan. feminist who knows. I'm just eat chocolate. Exactly like I shouldn't have thinks. done that. <laughs> Keep it going for Sarah Pascoe! <laughs> Hello. Um, So, as I mentioned already, I'm not an activist, and I've never, I don't think I've ever done any activism. I did go on the Women's March, and that's that's my first ever kind of rally or anything like that that I've been to. And I think the reason that I have never done anything is because to be an activist, you have to be so sure that you're right. The more I think about anything, the more confusing it becomes. So, basically, so good and bad, they are subjective terms they mean different things to all of us so most people agree Stalin very bad (laughs) but if you were a gulag maker (laughs) you'd be into him most people agree Mother Teresa very good but if you were Princess Diana bitch is your competition (laughs) so so even when you think you're one of the good guys you to someone else you're still bad and so this is the thing so the recent stuff that's happening in this country with leaving the eu with brexit i find very confusing because of my job because i stand up and i really really intelligent people and they were completely divided about this half of my friends were talking about how the eu created our laws and we didn't elect those people and that was undemocratic and the other half of my friends were saying yes but if we leave the eu then the most vulnerable in society become even more vulnerable as our economy fails and i was kind of stuck in between them and still am thinking how can you be deciding between democracy and the economy it's like they said to all of us, like, oh, guys, your house is on fire. But if you put it out, gravity will stop working. Like, Good luck. Like, what? Like, the whole thing feels like a game of, like, you know, when you're a child, you go to sleepovers, you play a game called Would You Rather? But it was always, you had two things you definitely didn't want, and you have to choose which one you don't want the least. Like, oh, would you rather have massive hands, but they're not attached to your body? <laughs> or tiny hands, but they're strangling you? <laughs> And by the way, one of them means you're racist. I do. I think it's really complicated. And I think like, sometimes we have to acknowledge that things are complicated. I'm trying to, I was, in preparation for this, I was trying to think, what am I unequivocally sure of? What am I definitely sure of? And I've written them down. So I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, okay, I'm sure that we are not defined by a gender, body or sexuality. I'm sure that children and animals should be respected and protected from harm. And... I'm sure that if you go out with someone's ex, you should be a little bit fatter than they are. (laughs) It's only fair. (laughs) I don't think tweeting is activism. I don't think it can be activism. I think it's showing off you read an article. I don't think any activism can happen in Facebook posts. On Facebook, it seems to be like a kind of competitive empathy. Like, you're showing other people how much you care. I don't think any system of oppression so far has been overthrown because an admin from Hornchurch told 172 online contacts it was bang out of order. (laughs) Um, Over New Year, I went to Costa Rica for a week. I've I've recently broken up with my boyfriend and done a very cliched thing, and I went on a, a spiritual yoga retreat. And um, it was very, very interesting. And on New Year's Eve, they made us all do a ceremony. The ceremony involved a fire where we wrote down things we regretted, we thought we forgave ourselves for, and the things that were difficult from the previous year. And we wrote down these intentions that we were then going to read out and to each other and chant for the New Year. Now, actually, I hated the ceremony because it was too spiritual for me, and they called down everyone's ancestors, which I thought was weird. Uh, yeah, you had to list all of your ancestors to bring them down. And I don't 
moment. I mean, I only said my mum and dad, and they're both alive, and uh, <laughs> definitely wouldn't want it to be there. Um, but, but, uh, so uh, you do this ceremony, and then so we all kind of sat in this circle, and everyone there, by the way, was uh, just like me, a middle-aged American divorcee. Uh, we thought the best of our lives were over. There was one lady called Barbara who's very cheerful, but we wore her down. And um, uh, so this ceremony, so we're all sitting there, there's like 24 women, and it's we're outside in Costa Rica in the jungle, and we're just kind of saying our intentions. And it turned out we all wanted exactly the same thing, which is peace and love, and to use that to get thinner. And, um, <laughs> and so we all did this thing. And then the lady who leads the retreat, she was like, OK, we've all asked for what we want. Now let's do some arms for Syria. Guys, so then everyone else, like, and this is when it, it's too, it was too much for me, it's too much. We sat there and very earnestly said, oh, like, for Syria. And my problem with this, and I think this is what I mean about online activism, I'm worried it makes us pat ourselves on the back that we think we did something. So we're like, oh, yeah, I've done my bit for Syria this year. I armed, like, I properly sent some goodness to them through the air with my ancestors. And look, and look honestly, honestly, if by the time this goes out and you're listening to this and Syria is solved, I take it back and they're geniuses. But this is what I worry about sometimes, like... Uh, there are people whose actual jobs, you can get paid to do good things. There are people whose jobs, they're nurses and teachers and fire people and they work in the police or anyone who does any kind of voluntary work. They're doing the biggest thing ever. I, I want to be a better part of society. I've written down this quote, which ironically is the Marquis de Sade. Now, the Marquis de <laughs> I know, right? The Marquis de Sade, he, uh, what, he's a fantastic philosopher, but obviously he believed other people's pain didn't matter. He, it didn't matter and that's why it was okay to hurt people. But this quote, I always think about it because he says... Do not topple their idols in anger, pulverise them in play. And I love it so much because, for me, the anger side of activism is what switches me off. I don't want to be aggressive. And again, I might have to change my mind about something when I get new information, which happens every day. And I feel like being open to people who believe that you're wrong and want to explain to you why is so much part of it. But we are also allowed to have a good time while trying to be better. And I love the theory that we're a self-domesticating species. Obviously, evolution is really, really slow, but there's a theory that we reward the people who treat us well and behave well to other people. And gradually, the aggression, the really horrible things that hurt our feelings that seem so terrible, but that are part of being a human being, that the little things do count along the way. That's the end of my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> amazing guests. I think we should get the guests out yes. and we talk about challenges. Yes. Uh, so are you ready to meet our guests? Yeah. So our first guest is a novelist who wrote a book called A Petrol Scented Spring, which is about suffragettes and the force feeding of the suffragettes. And our second guest is an activist, an organiser of the Polish black protest that happened last year in Poland a philosopher, journalist, and former policy advisor to the opposition in Poland. Please welcome to the stage, AJ Close and Agata Czarnatska. Hello and welcome. Uh, we should just explain that the black protest, um, yeah. because there's been a lot of discussion about intersectionality in our protest, and the black protest yeah. in Poland was sort of the colour of mourning that Polish women traditionally yeah. wear to protest, but it was a black protest in the colour of the clothing to discourage the government from enforcing even more draconian abortion laws than already exist. What are the abortion laws in Poland? Well, it's a thing with the Conservatives in Poland. They feel very much about uh, Catholicism and they want to, um, let's say, regulate other people's sexual lives. So uh, it was one of the first projects. Uh, it was not actually a government project. Those were the people, like people like us. Uh, they just wanted to regulate other people's lives and to ban abortion on the ground of Catholic religion. So basically in Poland at the moment, abortion is banned except in three different yes. circumstances. Yes. Um, it's rape, incest, and if the mother... Well, uh, rape and incest are one, of the, uh, one, yeah. one exception, like whatever, well, when the pregnancy results of a crime. Then uh, you have uh, 
the case of malformation of the fetus, which was actually the thing that they wanted to abolish, mm -hmm. that it would no longer be an exception. And then you have this grave risk to women's health or life. So if the fetus was not going to survive anyway, they were pushing through a bill to make yes, to yes, make and women they actually carry and the they baby to term uh, even or the fetus yes, to term even though uh, it wasn't yes, going to survive. Yes, and the governing party in Poland actually pushed through a law that compensated a woman uh, with 4,000 zloty, which is a little bit less than 1,000 pounds, uh, in case they gave birth to a person like this. So it's, it's a sort of payoff, for because yeah. if, okay. even if the baby dies, it's just okay. a payoff. It's just like, hey, we'll pay you to do it yes. because we don't want abortions here, yes. basically. And so that's what you were protesting, uh, this... This bill. Well, and yes. you successfully protested, didn't uh, you? Well, one of them, the well, legal ban, then this compensation has been introduced as a kind of countermeasure to our protests. So it's a little bit difficult in Poland with the conservatives. The problem is that they really, uh, they never did anything for the people to not get abortions, like provide them with sufficient, uh, well, competent sexual education yeah. or sufficient birth control. Uh, I think that's common with the right across the world, though. They don't want to stop people <coughs> getting pregnant when they don't want to be pregnant. They just want to control yeah. them what happens. Yes. And they want to, uh, in my opinion, they want to, uh, let's say, feed the uh, abortion underground because this way a lot of men, doctors, uh, get a lot of money and they are very happy with it. I see. Yeah, well, when I, we saw Trump signing that document, which basically said that overseas funding couldn't fund abortions, and there were like nine men standing around. And I did think to myself, I wonder collectively how many abortions those nine men have paid for. But I would say a lot. I mean, Trump must have paid for a lot of abortions, mustn't he? And I mean, that's probably oh. libelous, but... Well, that would, be an, that would be a... That would be I mean, I don't think he listens to anything about himself. He doesn't seem to mind what people say. Um, in terms of activism, you won. I yes. mean, this is extraordinary. You went out in the streets yes. Yes. and you took the day yes. off work. You got Polish women to take the day off work and to strike. Yes, more than 100,000 uh, people. Uh, we went to the streets. We wanted them to backpedal from the legislation, and they did. And it was amazing, really. I mean, it's genuinely exciting. You said, three that once, and I, I saw a politician there saying, we have been humbled. I saw them in the press. They were saying, this has taught us humility. They apologised. They didn't just drop it quietly. They actually said sorry. Well, some of them. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, the other said that, well... Those girls were actually outrageous. And they were vulgar because they had those uteruses on the, on the signs. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, we had those posters with uh, uteruses uh, saying, back off from my uterus. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, but it worked, so they backed off from your uterus, so the vulgar signs worked. AJ Close, you are the author of a novel, so you've done lots and lots of research on the suffragettes. They seem to be, let's not put too fine a point on it, when I read your book, like they were actually what we would now call terrorists. They were blowing things up, they were burning things down, they were smashing shop windows. We oh. don't do that now, do don't we? Don't we? <laughs> oh, well, sorry. <laughs> so, you do. What amazed me about these women, when I, because, I mean, I used to think, oh, suffragettes, they chain themselves to railings. You mm. know. Maybe they smashed the odd window. And then I started researching these women, and they were heavy duty. They, I mean, the, the women in Scotland, among the targets they bombed, not all the bombs went off. They weren't that good at bombing, I have to say. <laughs> they weren't um, weren't they? Rubbish at burning well, they had some good what? targets. Women aren't very good at the technicals. <laughs> what? They're very good at oh, fire what? raising. Guys, I'm being ironic, dude. <laughs> But I mean, they, you know, they, would, they tried to do things like blow up the Glasgow water main, the main one from mm. the reservoir. So that would, you know, they tried to blow up Rabbi Burns Cottage, which in Scotland is a huge thing. Any Dan Brown fans here, they do the Rosalind Chapel, which is this key yeah. place Beautiful. in the Da Vinci Code, they bombed that. And that, that bomb actually went off, but it was only a window they destroyed. They, <laughs> <laughs> just the dodgiest, most rubbish. Sort of, there's a lovely scene in your book where they're trying to burn down a stadium 
And then Arabella, who's a real historical figure, yeah. she's going under all the chairs to make sure there's nobody homeless there or a cat or a dog or anything because she doesn't want to hurt anybody. And they're running to get a taxi, which I love because I take a lot of taxis and I think that's my kind of activism. <laughs> and, oh, I've done the fine. Can I get a halo here? A signal? Oh, oh there we go. Um, and so they're waiting for a taxi, but they can't work out if the fire's going to go or not. And it's not. It doesn't go. Yeah. And then they all get arrested anyway. And then she sort of says, right, next time, if I'm going to get arrested, I've got to have a proper fire. But what I loved was her mother said, look, you can't both get arrested at the same time because, you know, it leaves me short. So if you're going to get arrested again, could you please take it in terms? You cannot do activism together anymore because Aunt Clara's coming for tea. And I can't say you're both in prison. So could you please do activism on alternative weeks? Which I think is so charming. <laughs> what I have to say here is... There are certain things called fictional licence. Some of that, some of that is true. Some of it I might have made up. Don't tell me that. I don't know that. I wouldn't believe it all. Oh, we're in a post-truth world. It doesn't matter. People I, making stuff up is the new. That, that is, is the that's, news. That's, that's right. Yeah, that's what Trump would call an alternative fact. <laughs> So the question is why they did this when we don't do mm. anything compared to that. The most amazing thing about it is that the, the heavy duty, the hardcore women, were by and large middle class for very good reasons. You know, if you're a working class woman, you were a breadwinner. If they were going to stick you in prison, then your family were going to mm. starve because nobody else was mm. going to feed your kids. So by and large, it was middle-class women who did the things which might lead to them getting heavy-duty jail sentences. The amazing thing about this is these women, it was the Edwardian era, but they were born in Victorians. They were brought up as Victorians. And their sisters in the movement, there were other women who, when they held meetings, would chalk on the pavement to say, this is where the meeting is. And was that their Facebook what that was their face chalk on the exactly pavement. Exactly right. That, but the thing is, what you'd just go down and have a little look at the pavement, yeah. and you'd go, "What if it rained?" And the chalk, you'd be going, "Oh shit!" Well, I, <laughs> that, I don't know what they did. Rain. Don't ask me questions like that. But the point is, there were women <laughs> who would think about it, would try it once. Of course, this is still they're still wearing corsets mm. and things, long dresses. A woman gets down on the ground, and some passing gentleman will think she's fainting because she's laced too tightly and we'll try and help her up and she's saying no no I'm trying to chalk a suffragette meeting so there are a lot of these women who were very you know who were well brought up and their hearts were in the right place but they said I cannot do this I cannot chalk on the pavement and then there were other women in the movement who were saying yeah, I can make a bomb and, you know, leave it at Rosalind Chapel, no bother. Wow. There was one interesting passage that I thought were, that it was really boring to be a young woman then and how exciting it was to have this Absolutely. opportunity to leave the house and just make trouble, like make noise and have a reason to do that and have a sort of single purpose that we're not going to stop making this trouble until we get the vote. Yeah. Do you think, Agatha, that having that single purpose was helpful, that you knew what you wanted them to back down from? Well, I'm not calling that a purpose. I'm calling that a pretext, a reason to go out, a reason to meet people, a reason to meet persons who are like me. And that was extremely important for us uh -huh. in Poland. We actually started with uh, collecting signatures under the project of a, of a law uh, for liberalizing the uh, situation of reproductive rights in Poland. Uh, so we met a lot, a lot of other women, and we were talking about our families, about our lives, about our sex, about our boyfriends, obviously, because... This sounds like an episode of Sex in the City. This is not what I was expecting at all. I was expecting sort of more, I don't know what, but this is fascinating. So you think actually friendship is the thing that will create the most successful activism? Absolutely, yes. Friendship and a good enemy as well. Oh. So perhaps you just don't get enemies who would be good enough in order to start good activism, like yeah. feel like you are really sure. Do you think this is why Trump has caused us to come out? Because we can all agree that Trump oh, please. is... Do you even have to ask? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, though. Like, we can all agree Trump's a cunt. Like, it's... it's, 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 it's we don't still all agree. Still a word, we my dear. We agree here, but we don't all agree. That's the well, thing. Well, who doesn't agree? Piers Morgan. <laughs> oh. oh! Well... No but, no, but we don't, like... So, this is the thing... We meet people who are on the right and they think that we don't have proper plans and we don't understand economics and we're led by our emotions. And sometimes you make these sweeping things that we all know. And it's actually, no, there are people who 
who don't agree with us. No, of course. But more women came out around the world than would normally come out. Yes. So it is more fair to say that more women are galvanised because I think two things are happening. One is Brexit means we're going to lose a lot of rights that which we'll have to mm. re uh, negotiate yeah. because we're covered under Europe. But um, also some of our rights were being eroded anyway in terms of birth control, just like with America. They're trying to shorten the amount of time until you, that you can have a viable abortion and things like that. That's already happening. True, but if we hard Brexit, mm. then we overnight may lose quite yes. a lot of rights, which we'll then have to kind of yeah. work our way back to. We may or we may not. Mm. We don't know what the situation is yet. I mean, that's the key thing about Brexit. We know fuck all about it. Mm. That's the one thing we can all agree on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We yes. don't know what we're going into. Oh, so I had a taxi driver who really understands it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, guys. Did you get his card? Could you come on the show and explain it? Yeah, he would I, love to. I, <laughs> so I feel like if, he, if we found the one man that knows what Brexit is... And if yeah. he could come on and just sort of lay it out for us, I think that would yeah. be very useful. I don't mind he's a taxi driver at all if he really does know. But I think that common cause, and I think we must agree, because what Trump stands for and what his cabinet stands for is actually fascist, he's actually racist, he's actually homophobic, yeah. he's actually misogynistic. And it's no good kind of going, oh, well, it's a bit complicated, because some of it isn't complicated. Some of it is simply going to erode our rights and the rights of vulnerable people and vulnerable marginalised groups that we care about, and those rights rights should not be eroded black and white. Well, yeah. we can be undecided, but then it's our right to be undecided because we still have the right to decide. And sometimes some people just come up and say, well, you are no longer going to be able to decide for yourself. And this is the moment when we are really, really angry. And this is the moment where you become sure, I believe. Mm. Uh, when someone takes away your own right to decide. Yep. And that's what the vote was about. It was about women didn't have that right to contribute in yeah. the conversation in the first place. That's right. I mean, I think one of the things was there was an enormous con because the idea was your, your husband would vote for you. He would know your best interests. And, but the point is there was this, this odd woman. They called it the odd woman problem, which was partly through a quirk of the birth rate and also because vast numbers of uh, young men went to the empire to administrate the empire in various ways. There were large numbers of women who were never going to get married and were going to have to earn a living for themselves, were going to be taxed. You know, you remember that phrase, no taxation without, without representation. representation. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't have any representation. So was there ever a consideration that women without husbands could vote and then once you got a husband, he could he, two for the price of one? Not that I know of. I mean, there were three bills that were all called conciliation bills where women were promised that they would get voting rights and each one fell at, at a hurdle for one reason or another. And that thing about you know, withdrawing people's rights. This was a promise, and women suffragettes sort of stepped down their protest, thinking it's in the bag, you know, and then one after another of these bills failed. And by the, last, the time the last one in 1912 failed, they thought, right, you know, <laughs> you have taken me for a mug, and that's when it got really, really violent. And there was that feeling, although it wasn't a right that was being taken away, there was that feeling that was a promise that was being broken, and that's why they got mad. They tried to do it peacefully, and when peaceful didn't work, yeah. they got violent. They did a lot of marching and a lot of petition signing and lobbying and all that stuff. So the question is, if our rights are being taken away, is there any time where we start saying, right, we're going to start smashing stuff up? No, I don't think so. I honestly think people don't listen when you do that. I think they but might be part of the movement. The no, they were well, part of something. I don't know that's They were true. part of something. We talked before about animal activism, where people still do really, really outrageous, aggressive... They make, they make bombs, and they stalk people, and they spread rumours that people are paedophiles, and they dig up dead bodies, and they do that. And if one day our farming practices improve, they will say that was because of them. And it wasn't. It's because of all the civilised conversation going on between reasonable people. I honestly think once you start smashing stuff, you look like a mad person no one needs to listen to. I think there's two sides to it. I think you have to raise the issue onto the agenda, and sometimes... Violence is the way. This is me obligated to terrorism. <laughs> but I'm saying that's what the suffragettes definitely believe. Yeah. And actually, I'm more likely to read a piece about 
somebody digging a dead body up for the sake of animals. It you know, does. It does. So, so another thing, so like feminine, right? So they get loads of publicity because they're very beautiful, topless women with slogans written on their breasts. Yeah. Um, so in our country, this is fantastic because the papers then can sell more papers and even if they're free papers, they give up more papers. Obviously, it's still selling some advertising. And the same with them, the fisheries campaign, they have a nude campaign, which means that the papers can legitimately, for political reasons, put topless, naked women on the front cover. And... I don't think anyone really listens very seriously to the reasons behind. I don't think people then go, God, I should stop eating tuna fish because there's a topless woman. With Femin, all of the press about them was kind of derisive. It wasn't, we need to have a discussion about what's happening in terms of abortion and the pill and FGM. Well, I'm pretty sure that you have to have both. Okay. Uh, like you have to have this advertisement uh, department mm. that makes bombs or takes off the clothes. And then you have to have the policymakers. Uh, people who are just argumenting uh, all the way through, uh, who are lobbying, yes, but also who are, you know, showing how absurd it is to stick to the situation. You have to have both, otherwise, well, the lobbyist is completely powerless without the advertisement, and the advertiser is completely powerless without the lobbyist. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I kind of think, and I'm not advocating violence at all, but I just think a lot of things do happen. Like, I wonder if we ever would have got the vote if we just kept on going, oh, okay, then we'll do another march. I'm not saying violence, but I am saying, what did you call them? Outrages, they used to call them. Yeah, they used to call them outrages, which was the same name they used for the Irish Republican terrorist acts. They were terrorists, really, these women, the hardcore. Uh, And they did outrages. And I think, is there a way that we, as guilty feminists, could plan some outrages that weren't violent and that didn't, like, smash up people's private property? I'm not saying, you know, like go down and smash up the W.H. Smith, because there's people in there no, working so, so, there who are going to get scared. What? But what's the outrage we can do that's activism, that's more than just, like, marching once a year and then going home and going on Facebook and sharing an article that only well, people like me is going to read? You can do, like, the Spartan women did. That was the first successful women's what, strike in the sex? history. Yeah. yeah, just don't have sex. Or... Uh, I don't know about that, because I think... Oh, that it's very, very... <laughs> yeah, it, it really has an impact. But I plays into the patriarchal idea that women don't like sex. Who am I going to have sex with? Also, having sex with men. I feel like we're on a real cliffhanger of a conversation. When we come back, we're going to talk about this more. We're going to talk about the march. We're going to ask these guys more questions, and you can ask them questions, because normally we have time for one or two questions, but we're going to have time for lots of questions, because we've got a whole second half. And we have Um, another guest. And we have another guest. Yes, absolutely. We have another guest who's going to join our panel. So have a lovely active interval. Do an outrage in the interval, but not a violent one. (laughs) See you for part two. I'm a feminist, but when I wrote these, I didn't know that Tom from Bake Off and his white cake... Shit. (laughs) His white cake. His white cake. His white cake. (laughs) She is white. I feel like you've made this show a white supremacist show now. Do you think I've I've pushed it too far? Yes. Yeah. I think that's the officially. No, it's too late. (laughs) I'm a feminist. Hello, Guilty Feminists. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for writing in. Thank you for all your support over the last year. Now, many of you have expressed a desire to get involved, to make some of these challenges real and alive, especially along the lines of career development, not apologising, stepping into the space. So we have some workshops. Now, these are just the start. We're just testing the waters here in London, and then hopefully we'll be able to bring them around the country and even even wider internationally. The first two will be on the 22nd and 23rd of April. Jessica Regan, who's an actor who was in the Gender Blind Henry V, and I are going to do a workshop on big speeches, uh, male speeches from Shakespeare, speeches from history, taking the space and owning it. You can book for those workshops on guiltyfeminist.com. The price will be £50 for a day workshop, 
but there will be £10 places for those who cannot afford the £50. And please chip in a little bit more for another feminist to join the workshop if you can afford more. We want these to be accessible to everyone and intersectional. Um, we also have more of a corporate leadership day. Many of you know that I go into the corporate world and work with women on taking up the space. So there's going to be a very big leadership event uh, with me speaking and other brilliant people that you can work with, uh, a special Guilty Feminist episode uh, on negotiations uh, with Suzanne Williams, who is uh, well known for negotiating with people who have hostages for the government uh, and for other organizations. And that is going to be an incredible special leadership day. Hopefully you can get your company to sponsor you to come on that if you are in the corporate world. That day will be £195, but again, there'll be £10 places. Please chip in more if you can or pay if you can. If you can't, please write in and you can go on our list for a £10 place. Details of all these things are on guiltyfeminist.com.